Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Right, so the uh, final talk of the morning will be by Kristen Otter, one of the organizers, on computing genus to curves. Thank you. Thank you. So I won't say thank you to the organizers for inviting me because uh, <laughs> unfortunately I'm giving this talk on behalf of Tonghai Yang, who was um, supposed to be here giving this talk on our joint work, um, and he's had some unfortunate medical problems. So very sorry that he can't be giving the talk. Um, but I am very happy to talk to you about this work, which I think is a lot of fun. And in the second half of my talk, well, in the end of my talk anyway, I'm going to actually talk about the continuation of this project, which is joint work with Michael Narek, who's a postdoctoral researcher in our group. So let me just give you the short version of this talk, the one sentence version. That is, I'm going to show you how to compute genus 2 curves from two invariants on the Hilbert moduli space instead of from three invariants on the Ziegel moduli space. And I'm going to try to convince you that this is a good thing to do and give you a bunch of examples and show you the kinds of research that it's leading to. So um, let me just start with some context for the more general, broader audience here. Um, Suppose that you want to do um, discrete logarithm-based cryptography. So you have some group, and you're going to want to either do a protocol in cryptography which is based on the discrete logarithm problem, or maybe uh, some pairing-based protocol. So as we all know from the title of this conference, you can do that on an elliptic curve with the group of points on an elliptic curve and the pairing on an elliptic curve. But you can also do that on the Jacobian of a higher genus curve. So for those of you that aren't familiar with what the Jacobian is, you can think of it as just being a group which is associated to a curve. So when you move away from the miracle of elliptic curves, which are both curves and groups, you have nice algebraic curves, but they're not groups anymore. There's no group law to compose elements and do cryptography. So in um, the higher genus case, you have to associate a group to the curve, and that's what we're going to call the Jacobian. And I'm not going to go into what the group law is and how you do the group law operations and the pairing and all of that. You just have to kind of believe me that um, those all work very efficiently, even in genus 2. And people have studied that very intensively, actually, in the last 5 to 10 years. And um, we're just going to think of this as a problem of actually constructing a curve for which you would want to build a crypto system based on the hardness of the discrete logarithm problem. So why would you do this instead of using an elliptic curve? So the very short answer is that if you take an elliptic curve which has coefficients in a finite field FP, um, the size of the group of points on the elliptic curve is roughly P. It's within square root of P of the, it's plus or minus square root of p of p. Whereas if you take the group of points on the Jacobian of a genus 2 curve, the size of the group is p squared. So the point is that your underlying field that you pick where you define your curve can be much smaller if you do genus 2 curve cryptography. So for example, if you want to work at the 2 to the 256 bit security level for your, the size of your group, um, and the, the security would then be the square, roughly the square root of this for elliptic curves. If you want to work at that level for genus 2 curves, you can pick a much smaller field, a field of half the size. So as we move towards um, architectures like 64-bit architecture and, and beyond maybe, it could be attractive if we get to the point where um, field elements could fit in a single word, that kind of thing can really contribute to efficiency. So, in particular, at one of the more recent ECCs, um, Dan Bernstein and Tanya Langa gave a series of talks which compared the efficiency of genus 2 and genus 1 curves and found that they're extremely competitive at the same security level. So, um, and the applications are the usual kind of cryptographic things and then extensions to all kinds of pairing protocols as well, which we heard about in the last talk. 
Okay, so the big challenge though, as with many of the different pairing-based crypto systems, is to actually instantiate your system. So how do you build a genus two curve which has, let's say, a prime order on, of its Jacobian? Now, we don't actually need exactly a prime order. It could have a very small cofactor, but roughly speaking, we'd like, we can be a little flexible, but we'd really like there to be um, a very large uh, cyclic subgroup of our Jacobian, which is very close to the total order of the group of points on the Jacobian. So um, the problem is that this problem is hard. So in elliptic curves, uh, with elliptic curves, one thing that you can do, uh, since we've heard a number of talks about how lightning fast it is to count points on elliptic curves, you can randomly choose curves and then wait until you find one that has a nice order of points, that, a nice order, a group order for the number of points on the elliptic curve. Well, this is um, still currently a pretty slow thing to do for a genus two curve cryptography at the minimum security levels that we're looking at. So there has been some new work, um, uh, Godry and some of his co-authors this year, um, improving the point counting uh, methods for genus two and getting, um, getting to this security level, but still um, to be able to you, I don't think you could call it lightning fast to randomly generate genus two curves and count the number of points. So, I mean, we're getting there from that side as well. But I'm going to tell you about approaching the problem from the other side, which is actually constructing a curve which you know ahead of time is going to have a certain order um, for the group order of its Jacobian. So, um, yesterday we heard from Bianca Verai, who uh, essentially outlined this method very quickly in the beginning of her talk as a generalization of the uh, genus one um, CM method that Francois Morin talked about. Um, so uh, this is just a very high level version of the algorithm. Kind of decide how many points you want. Let's say you want n points on the Jacobian. And in fact, for genus two, that's not enough to determine the entire zeta function. You actually need the number of points on the curve over the base field FQ and over the degree two extension. And that will determine the zeta function and in turn determine the number of points on the Jacobian. And given that information, what you can do is you can compute a CM field which corresponds to this uh, zeta function. And I'll just show you how to do that really quickly. That's not the focus of the talk. And this is the focus of the talk is to explain to you what it means to compute modular invariance of what are called CM points associated to this field K. And then from this, reconstruct the curve via Mestre's algorithm. So the whole, most of the talk is going to be focused on explaining how we do this process, computing modular invariance associated to a field K. So how, how is a, a CM field, what is a CM field first of all, and how is it related to the number of points on the curve that you want. So I'm very, just very quickly going to show this calculation just because it's very, very simple. And I think it, it's more convincing than just telling you, oh, well, it can be done. So this is the analog of explaining the fact that on, a, on an elliptic curve, if an elliptic curve has q plus 1, let's say, plus, t, plus or minus t points, T is the trace of the Frobenius element, and that, because you know that the Frobenius element pi times pi bar is equal to P, if P is your, uh, the size of your underlying finite field, if you know the trace and you know its norm, then you know the whole characteristic polynomial, and that determines a CM field, which in the genus 1 case is just an imaginary quadratic field. So in, our, in the genus two case, what happens is, is that there's uh, two pieces of information, not just the trace of Frobenius, but another, p uh, the, another symmetric function in the roots of the characteristic polynomial. And this determines not a, an imaginary quadratic field, but a quartic CM field. So a CM field is an imaginary quadratic extension of a totally real field. So here we're talking about an imaginary quadratic extension of a totally real quadratic field for genus two. And so what is this field? Well, here it is. Let's say we, picked, we had picked n1 and n2 the num for the number of points on our curve. The Jacobian would have n points, which is n1 squared plus n2 over 2 minus q. And if you set s1, equal to this number, and then you set S2 equal to this number, 
then the quartic polynomial that is satisfied by the Frobenius associated to this curve is just this polynomial right here. And this determines a uh, quartic CM field. And so, when I've said, I, so what I've said so far is, is that um, we want to have a curve which has this certain number of points. And here I'm saying, well, if it had that number of points, it would have a Frobenius, which was satisfying this characteristic polynomial. And Frobenius is both an endomorphism, and we're thinking of it here as being an algebraic, an algebraic integer, actually. And this endomorphism is um, kind of this kind of extra information for this group. Uh, this is J of C is an abelian group. But here we're saying it has a larger endomorphism ring. It actually has an, uh, an endomorphism which is pi, which is the Frobenius in this field. OK, so that was all supposed to really explain what it means to be a CM point associated to a field K. So we're going to say a curve has CM by the ring of integers of a quartic CM field OK. Um, okay if OK embeds into the endomorphism ring. So now the CM points associated to a field K are the isomorphism classes of um, its really principally polarized abelian varieties, which are the Jacobians of uh, CM curves. So um, when, for much of the talk, I'm going to be working on the moduli space of a principally polarized abelian surfaces. And what you should think of is that you can associate with a, um, a curve, it's Jacobian, which is a point in this moduli space. But you can also think of the, um, it as if you have an isomorphism of the Jacobian, that will also give you an isomorphism of the curve. So interchangeably, people often talk about being a curve with CM by K or a, the Jacobian of a curve with CM by K. And we really mean the same thing. It means OK embeds in the endomorphism ring of the Jacobian of the curve. OK, so what I'm going to be concerned with is evaluating certain modular functions on the moduli space at these CM points. And this is a, kind of a long answer to one of the questions that was asked in Bianca Verai's talk yesterday. So if you have modular functions, and what does it mean to evaluate them mod p? Well, that's what I would like to explain here. So the Ziegel moduli space is, in this case, we're going to look at um, genus 2. It parameterizes abelian surfaces with principal polarization. And um, Ziegel gave this very nice uh, description, which is that, OK, so let's let sp2, which some people call sp4, Z be the symplectic group of, um, uh, for genus 2 consisting of 4 by 4 integral matrices satisfying this relation. And then um, you have this, uh, what we call a Ziegel, Ziegel upper half plane, which instead of being the usual upper half plane, is actually 2 by 2 matrices with entries in C which have their imaginary part has to be positive definite. So the imaginary part of this matrix should be positive definite. And the um, Ziegel upper half plane um, is acted upon by this um, simple, uh, symplectic group SP to Z. And the quotient is what we'll call the open Ziegel modular threefold, or Ziegel moduli space. OK, and the way that this acts is, should be very familiar from the genus 1 case, except for these are now 2 by 2 matrices, the A's and the B's and the tau's and everything. And the nice part is that we can, in this moduli space, we can give an explicit presentation for the CM points in the moduli space associated to a field K. So um, this was originally done by um, Spalik in 94, who was, who was a student of Gerhard Frey. And she did it only for the case where the real quadratic subfield of K has class number 1. And this was extended um, a couple of years ago by Marco Streng in his thesis so that he gave a nice characterization of what the CM points look like even if you don't have real class, uh, the real quadratic field with class number 1. So I'm not giving you the description, but um, it, it's something that you need to write down if you want to evaluate the functions on those points. It's an important 
aspect of the calculation. Okay, so what Ziegler, or sorry, what Igusa did was um, we heard, we saw these functions in Bianca's talk yesterday, and we heard about the what are called the Igusa class polynomials. Igusa defined these modular functions on the moduli space, which essentially play the role, I'm, I'm lying a little bit here, but they essentially play the role of the J function. In, in the elliptic curve, with, for elliptic curves, the, um, the J function is a modular invariant in the sense that, at least over an algebraically closed field, two elliptic curves are isomorphic if and only if their J invariants are equal. And these, um, what we're going to call absolute Igusa invariants, play that role for um, Cobians of genus 2 curves as long as you stay away from the set where the first invariant is 0. Um, there's also some issues in characteristic 2 and 3, but outside of that set, these play the role of the J function. So um, what we're going to do is we're going to use these to form three Igusa class polynomials, which the way we do this is we run through all of these, um, these uh, CM points that I told you we know how to figure out a set of representatives for that represent all the isomorphism classes of curves which have CM by K and evaluate those Ziegel modular functions. And the point is, there's a couple of points. First of all, you have to evaluate these functions to very high precision so that when you multiply this out, this is supposed to be a polynomial which has coefficients not in, in Z as it does for the genus 1 case, but in Q. And so you need very high precision. And the whole issue that Bianca's talk yesterday was focused on was the fact that these denominators can be fairly large. And we need to have an idea of the size of the denominators in order to work backwards to be able to get the right precision to estimate the amount of precision that we need to evaluate these two so that we can actually recognize the rational numbers that come out. Uh, if you make a guess at the size of the denominator in some line, then can you confirm that you got the right polynomial? Well, the typical way that we do that is to take the curve that we constructed and check if it has the right number of points. So that's the way that you do it in practice, which is very fast. You just take a point on it and see if it's killed by the group order that w you picked, which was supposedly close to a prime. Um, but I guess now we actually do have theoretical proved, ba I mean, proved bounds on these sizes, which then you can actually use to say, look, we really did compute the right thing here, because we know that we only needed this much precision in order to get it right. OK, so now what I'd like to do is to switch gears. I was talking about the Ziegel moduli space up until now. And notice that there were three of these. In fact, if I hadn't lied to you and we wanted to take care of all the in, um, Igusa invariants, we, we, we would have actually had 10 of these. But they really amount to computing essentially the same um, the values of these same modular functions anyway. So it's not like it's three times as much, more than three times as much work to do all 10. But um, I'm just trying to keep it simple. That's why I'm focusing on the, th on the three class polynomials. OK, so now let's switch gears. So forget about the Ziegel moduli space for a moment. The Hilbert moduli space is associated to a real quadratic field. So what you should think of is that I, I talked about the moduli space, the Ziegel moduli space, which parameterizes abelian surfaces, which are principally polarized. And then we had a collection of CM points on those. So those CM points, that meant that OK, the ring of integers in the, the quartic uh, CM field, actually embedded into the endomorphism ring. So I'm going to put this up here for reference, that our CM field was K. And we're going to call its real quadratic field. From now on, we're going to call it F. And a CM point on the Ziegel moduli space had OK embedded into the endomorphism ring of the Jacobian. But this, of course, also means that the, end, the, uh, the ring of integers of F was also already embedded in the Jacobian, so in the endomorphisms of the Jacobian. And so what happens is that um, naturally, if you shift over to the Hilbert moduli space, which is abelian surfaces uh, with real multiplication by your fixed real quadratic field, 
then you, you still have all those points that you were concerned with, those CM points. They actually live on the Hilbert moduli space too because they have the, um, the OF embedded in the endomorphism ring already. So that's the, kind of, that's the point behind what we're doing here. So let F be a real quadratic field. So you'll notice these conditions here with prime discriminant D congruent to 1 mod 4. Um, some of this can be removed, but also part, some of the conditions actually come from what Bianca talked about yesterday, which is, is that you want, that, um, you want the, the Brunier-Yang formula to actually be true so that you can use it to correctly estimate your denominators and multiply through and know that you'll be looking for um, integer coefficients. So um, under, under this assumption, let sigma be the um, non-trivial Galois conjugate of F, conjugation of F over Q. And epsilon is a unit such that um, its norm is minus 1. And then um, this, actually I didn't write down the action of SL2OF on the two, this is two copies of the upper half plane, not the Ziegel upper half plane in dimension 2. The two is upstairs, not downstairs. So this is two copies of the upper half plane with the action of SL2OF. And um, what I'm going to show you is if you have, if you have a, a modular function on the Ziegel moduli space, I'm going to show you how to pull it back to a modular function on the Hilbert moduli space um, and vice versa. Okay, so what is the map between these two spaces? This is all well-known um, stuff and um, we just work it out for computational um, purposes here. So if you have Z, which is Z1, Z2, this will be a uh, this is a point in two copies of the upper half plane. And an element A of the real quadratic field, um, this is the notation we're going to use. Z star is a diagonal matrix with Z1 and Z2 on the diagonal. A star it has A and sigma of A on the diagonal. And then gamma star, this is actually a, um, this is going to be a, um, uh, of now you can see this is no longer a two by two matrix. This is a four by four matrix because these stars in here are two by two matrices. And if we have, we we're going to choose a z basis for for O F. Um, and so far, okay, I'll I'll tell you the secret right now. We're going to end up taking f as q squared to 5. All right, so that's most of the rest of the talk is going to be q squared to 5. Most of this you could do for, like I said, d was congruent to 1 mod 4 and prime. You could probably even do it more generally. Um, but you have to work out a separate pullback map for each different d. And um, in general, um, we're probably still going to want to stick with the assumption that, o, that um, F has class number one. So think like in the, the Spalik world for the Ziegel modular functions. So, um, so o, F will usually have class number one. If this is a Z basis. If this, all of this does not depend on the choice of Z basis. And you write down this matrix R, which is E1, E2, sigma E1, sigma E2. Bunch of notations, sorry for all of this. This is all to explain what the pullback is. We're going to define this map. This is going from two copies of the upper half plane, which is for the Hilbert moduli space, to the Ziegel upper half plane. And what does it do? It takes a Z and it sends it to um, this, which is, this is a diagonal two by two matrix. And this is a, um, oh, sorry. Yeah, R is also a two by two matrix. So um, this phi is going to go from SL2F to SP2Q, and it maps. Um, so this has to take two by two matrices to four by four matrices, and it does that by kind of expanding gamma into a gamma star, and multiplying um, on basically conjugating by S, where S is this matrix, which is determined by R, but also depends on the real quadratic field here. See the square root of D and the epsilon in there. Okay, so what happens is that we can now form a map which is between the moduli spaces, 
In other words, our, that map that I showed you actually factored through this quotient. And now I'm just going to switch to f equals q squared of 5 for the rest of the talk. So if you had picked a different f, there would have been an equally explicit description of this, which we give a general <coughs> theorem for. But you'd have to write it out separately with a new description of exactly what, what the image is. It's, it's very, very easy. It just basically depends on d. So um, this is what happens. If you look at a two, um, an element z, which ha has two coordinates in the two, upper half, two copies of the upper half plane, it gets sent to this, which is now in the Ziegel moduli space. So for anyone who's had to construct CM points on the Ziegel moduli space, you'll know that it's kind of a pain. And so um, it's not surprising that this looks kind of a little bit, it's not too ugly, but it looks somewhat complicated. And it involves like um, the Scalwa action. And you have to take care of things have certain um, imaginary parting having certain sign and all kinds of stuff like that, um, basically for the polarization to work out right. But the issue is that when you evaluate those Ziegel modular functions, which I wrote down the EGUSA functions, but I didn't tell you very much about evaluating them, you're evaluating them on these two by two matrices. And these are actually um, uh, symmetric. Did I forget that condition? In the <laughs> They're supposed to be symmetric. It might not have been in the, in the statement before. Um, and so it's really like evaluating those modular functions on three inputs here, because you've got these two by two matrices, but these, these are the same. So um, what happens is that to evaluate them, you can actually write down Fourier series for Fourier expansions for these Ziegel modular functions and for the Hilbert modular functions. And what you get is these power series, which are power series in these variables that are of this form q1, q2, and q3 for the Ziegel moduli case, which is this is the exponential function evaluated at this thing. This is actually x above uh, 2 pi i times this thing. So um, for the Hilbert moduli functions that, modular functions that we're going to evaluate, the kind of one of the big uh, points of doing things this way is there's only two variables. There's only a q1 and a q2 instead of having a q1, a q2, and a q3 in the, in the Fourier expansion. And what you can see is, is that that actually makes a big difference from the point of view of computation because each one of these exponential functions is something that you have to evaluate um, typically to very high precision because it's going into a computation where there's going to be lots of multiplications and things like that. And you want to retain enough precision so that your, your answer will be accurate in the end. So the more variables you have, the more of these exponential functions you have to evaluate. And also, the more um, multiplications you have to do, multiplying them together and thereby potentially losing precision. OK. so. Um, this is how you pull back. Let's say I gave you the Fourier expansion for the Ziegel modular function. I actually probably should have written that up here. So I'm just going to write it like this. Let's say f of tau had an expansion like this. Ooh. So for Ziegel modular functions, we usually write it's a sum over 2 by 2 matrices t of these, these coefficients of the Fourier expansion, I'm going to call a sub f of t. And then here's the three variables, q1, q2, q3. And this would be something like, let's call it tau1, tau2, and epsilon, where tau was tau1, tau2, and well, it might be epsilon over 2. I forget, but it's roughly that. Um, so if you want to take a function like this, and now you want to pull it back to the Hilbert moduli space, what you do is um, you, can, you can write down a Hilbert modular function, g, which has um, coefficients. See, it's in two variables now. And you need to sum over elements which are totally positive elements of 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 this form. So that makes this. Um, the a, like for a given a, there's only a finite number of b's such that this will be totally positive. And 
you need to compute this coefficient now, and this coefficient will be exactly the sum of the coefficients for the Ziegel modular function, which satisfied this condition. So for a given a and b, you can see that this is also a finite list of m1s, m2s, and m's, because it has to satisfy all these conditions. These guys are positive, and et cetera, et cetera. So that means that each, for, uh, each coefficient a, g of t for your new Hilbert modular form is just a sum of the coefficients for the Ziegel modular form that you started with, which in our case will be the EGUSA, the modular forms used for the EGUSA function. OK, so now what I need to tell you is the analog of the Eisenstein series that we use for Ziegel, in the Ziegel space um, for the Hilbert moduli space, because this is what we actually need to compute if you want to implement this method. You need to evaluate Hilbert Eisenstein series up to a certain amount of precision. And actually, I have seen some titles of talks given by people at workshops organized by William Sage, Will, William Steins. <laughs> I think actually we should just start calling him William Sage, don't you think so? And I think that some people probably know how to evaluate these Hilbert Eisenstein series a lot better than I do. So I'm just telling you a naive version. Um, and the pe person's name that comes to mind is John Voigt, but there might be others. Um, so this is not an optimized way to evaluate Hilbert Eisenstein series, but this is a way to evaluate them, which is that um, you need to compute these coefficients here. These are going to be the basic um, Eisenstein series of even weight. And these BKs of Ts, these are actually um, not too hard to compute, but they um, depend on, you can see this T is generating an ideal in OF. And you need to sum over ideals that contain this ideal. So you're going to be looking at the splitting of um, the primes dividing this ideal and doing a little computation there. But if you do all that right, and these are just constants that you compute for each k, then you'll get um, the, expansion, the Fourier expansions for these Eisenstein series. And you can see they look, they look very simple. These are um, what, what you can see here is, is that in this case, we've kind of pulled out the, uh, like for example, in this line, we've pulled out the q1. And here we've pulled out the q1 squared. And here we've pull, pulled out the q3, uh, q1 to the cube. And so here, the power of this is a equals 1, a equals 2, a equals 3. And then for each a, you have a few terms where you can see the, the, the extent to which b can get negative is limited. So you've got a, a few terms coming from a, a b for each a. So the reason that I'm kind of emphasizing this is because in the Ziegel moduli space, when you have three of these, actually before coming upon this technique to pull them back, I thought some um, with Rainier Broker about how to optimize the computation of the Ziegel you know, Fourier expansions. And with the three functions, uh, the three exponentials basically to be evaluated, it wasn't exactly clear how to organize the order of computations in the best way to make it the most efficient. And part of the point of what I'm trying to say here is, is that this pullback map actually does a lot of that work for you. It kind of reorganizes the computation for you and allows you to compute a lot less. OK, so what I'm going to define here are the analog of the, the cusp forms that we saw in the Ziegel case. So we've got theta 6 is this combination of these Eisenstein series. And here's theta 10. And just so you know, theta 10 is basically the pullback of chi 10, which was the thing that was in the denominator of the EGUSA functions, which, is, which was the topic of Bianca Verai's talk yesterday. So um, this actually, I think you can even ignore theta 12 for this talk. Mostly you should focus on theta 10 and theta 6. And there's a very nice theorem of Guntlach, which has led us to call these Guntlach invariants. And it states that the ring of symmetric holomorphic Hilbert modular forms for SL2OF is a polynomial ring in G2, G6, and theta 10. And um, the meromorphic, um, symmetric meromorphic Hilbert modular functions are all rational functions in these two invariants. 
So we're going to call these the Guntlach invariants. But in fact, there could be reasons for choosing different invariants, other, other ways to kind of recombine these things. So here's two more possible choices. J3 could be set to be this function, and then you would use J1 and J3. Or J4 could be set to be this function, and then you could use J2 and J4. And it wasn't clear to us when we wrote this paper which would be better. But for computations that Michael Narek has been doing, he's been focusing on J2 and J4 um, as a good choice. And the trade-off seems to be that here, J1 and J3 are both relatively small, whereas, which is generally good when you're multiplying things together because you lose less precision. But here, they have the advantage that both invariants have the denominator of chi 10. So then you're in the situation that Bianca's talk was focusing on yesterday, where both denominators are chi 10, and we basically know what they are from the Brunier Yang formula. If not exactly, then up to the you know, kind of correction factors that she was pointing out yesterday. Is this for arbitrary f? I'm sorry? Is this for arbitrary f, or are you already specializing? Arbitrary f, f did you yeah. say? Yeah. Well, as we saw yesterday, Brunier Yang is only proved for um, both d prime congruent to 1 mod 4 and d twiddle, which is the um, norm in the, the relative norm in the reflex field, prime and 1 mod 4. The Guntlach invariants? Yeah. Oh, no, right. The invariants over general field? This, this was a statement about Eisenstein series <coughs> and nothing about anything in so to compute these, the computation of these things depends on f. But for each f, this is true. OK. So anyway, what you can do is using the pullback formulas that we, however, this is something which is true for f equal q squared 5. And then you just have to redo it using our formulas for a different f. But this is what the EGUSA um, functions pull back to when f is q squared 5. OK, so um, I, for example, I think you can see that right here, that these, this pullback, it sums over AF's coefficients of the Ziegel modular function. But it sums according to these conditions, which depend on A and B, which were giving you elements of OF, which had to be totally positive and things like that. So, if you switched out the real quadratic field, some A and Bs might work for one field, but not for another. So it would give you different contributions to the pullback. OK, so this was, these are the three um, pullbacks of the EGUSA functions. And so what we're going to do is we're going to um, just compute these guys, either J1, J2, or J1, J3, and J2, J4, whichever choice you end up deciding to make, and um, evaluate them to high enough precision so that we can recognize them mod P, and then use those formulas to reconstruct the curve from the usual Mestre's algorithm. OK, so here's an algorithm for computing Guntlach invariance. And so in a in addition to the com yeah, so I've already made a few comments about um, why this might be better. So I'll just go through the algorithm first and then make some more comments on this. So if k is a primitive quartic CM field and you want the modular invariance for the CM points associated to k, um, and you're going to want a curve over a field FP, where p is a prime <coughs> which splits completely into principal ideals in k star. The only reason for that is, is that we want ordinary reduction, then we want p to be a relative norm, and so that we'll have either two or four possible group orders. Um, you can also do things if p doesn't satisfy that, that condition, but I'm not going to talk about that here. So um, you figure out basically the prime that you want and the group order that you want coming from this field k, and now you want the curves that have cm by this field. And so um, the output is going to be the Guntlach invariance mod p um, for genus 2 curves. And then you can, like I said, use Mestre's algorithm to re regenerate the curve. So what do you do 
Part of my claim was is that it's actually easier to write down the CM points on the Hilbert moduli space as well. So let me show you how that works. Um, again, like I said in the beginning, we um, kind in this presentation we're using the um, the uh, this particular form for OK, the ring of integers of K <coughs> over OF. So having F have real, um, the real quadratic field having class number one is being <coughs> used here in this presentation. You might be able to get around it somehow, but I, I don't know. Um, and then if M is um, good, the Galois closure of K over Q, which could be not equal to K if K is um, uh, a um, dihedral field. Uh, we want the imaginary part, we want delta such that the imaginary part of square root of delta is positive and this imaginary part of sigma of delta is positive. And then what we're going to do is the same as in the um, usual Igusa case, we uh, compute the class number and find the ideals which generate the class group of K. And then we write our ideals in this form, OF times A plus OF times B plus root delta over 2, where A is totally positive. Uh-oh. Sorry. Lost a norm symbol. It's supposed to be <laughs> the norm of A. And, that, um, and then we set Z equal to B plus root delta over 2A. And then the CM points, so these are just going to be um, pairs of points in the upper half plane. So um, one CM point associated to um, this CM type phi, let's say, is just Z comma sigma Z. But you can also get the CM point associated to phi prime. Uh, sorry, I forgot to tell you. There's Maybe I should just very quickly say, a CM type for a CM field is a choice of essentially half of the complex embeddings. And no two of them should be complex conjugate of each other. So for genus 2, it's uh, a choice of two embeddings. And there's actually four CM types. But in general, we only need to consider two of them to, in order to get all the isomorphism classes. And even in the case that K is Galois, you actually even only need to consider one CM type in order to get representatives for all isomorphism classes. <coughs> this was basically worked out by Schwalik, definitely in the class number, F has class number one case. OK, so these are the CM points. And you can see they're just very easy to write down. They come directly from the representation of the ideal <coughs> class, as opposed to having to do some extra fancy work like uh, Schwalik and Marco Streng did to find something that works for a particular symplectic basis, et cetera, et cetera. So this is directly what the CM points are given epsilon and <coughs> Z coming from the representation of the ideal. So now the next step is that step was writing down the CM points. This step is evaluating the Guntlach invariants at these points and forming the minimal polynomials. Hopefully, you actually recognize them as having rational coefficients. That will happen if you, for example, estimate the denominator correctly using the Brunier Yang formula or some uh, adjustment to it. And then you reduce, once you've recognized these as polynomials with rational coefficients, you can, rec you can reduce modulo a prime that doesn't divide the denominator and find the roots. And then you can compute the curve using the pullback formulas. And you can apply Mastris algorithm to the Ingusa invariance. OK, so that's the algorithm. And these are my claims as to why this should be better. A couple of things I've already said. CM <coughs> points are easier to write down. There's two variables instead of three. There's, that means fewer exponentials to evaluate, fewer multiplications. These functions also have smaller heights, which you'll kind of see that rather prominently in the examples. And there's two, invari yeah, two invariants instead of three. It's not only two functions, two variables, but two invariants. And um, we have pretty good control over the precision uh, needed. OK, so before I start giving you a whole bunch of examples, 
Let me try to put this in the context of a lot of related work, much of it by many people in this room. So in the genus, basically it's been about 15 years now that we've been seriously trying to um, construct genus 2 curves, starting with the thesis of, of Spalik. And um, here, instead of just listing the first person that did something, I'm, I kind of tried to write down everybody that did something. Um, and I think I haven't missed anyone, but if I have, please let me know. Um, so in the complex analytic method, which just means taking these EGUSA functions and trying to evaluate them by any method that you can to high enough precision so that you'll be able to recognize them. And um, von Wamlin, for example, those were all the examples that Bianca showed you yesterday. Um, Annegret Vang, and then I implemented this algorithm 10 years ago with Henry Cohen. And then more recently, um, Regis Dupont, who is a student of Francois uh, Morin, and Marco Streng. So we've also tried very hard several other methods. The CRT method is Chinese remainder method. Chinese remainder theorem method, which is completely different. It attempts to recognize these minimal polynomials by doing only operations over various small finite fields and trying to reconstruct the polynomial using the CRT method. Um, and in the, uh, the third approach is the piatic method. And um, I think basically the first paper paper on this was the five author paper, Godry, Houtman, Ritzenthaler, Wang, and, and Cole. And then I think there's several follow-up papers by Cole and Lubitsch for the two attic and three attic um, ca uh, cases. And in particular, um, David has provided a very nice online database with many examples, which I think is the only database right now that's available with lots and lots of examples. And so I would like to just comment a little bit on this pluses and minuses or strengths and weaknesses of these three methods because it's a bit of a zoo so it could be a little bit confusing. So one thing that happens here is that you have to, you have to evaluate these functions to very high precision and this is what I'm trying to kind of um, explain to you that we think we've improved in the, in, by using Hilbert modular functions instead. And the main problem there is even though I mean some methods are better than others for example DuPont's method is probably much better than um, the methods. Oh, actually, I, I should have said I also worked on this with Rainier Broker. I should have added Rainier's name here because we've evaluated very high using the Fourier expansion of the EGUSA functions instead of the theta functions approach, which is what uh, DuPont has a very fast method for doing. So. Um, that, that has the de de default, this method has the default that you lose precision when you multiply things together. And when the formulas are extremely complicated, it's hard to estimate how much precision you've lost. There's 10 even theta characteristics, and they could be of varying sizes, and you have to bound the size of all of them, basically from below and above, in order to do all these operations, and to know that you've actually maintained the amount of precision that you uh, wanted to have. Um, so on the other hand, the CRT <coughs> method has a big flaw, which is that you end up doing lots and lots and lots of computations, um, mod, mod, let's call it mod L for smaller Ls, where you first, you just even have to find a curve that's in the right isogeny class. And that in itself has, you know, tended to dominate the, the, um, the, uh, the time in this algorithm. And, and Damien Robert made quite a lot of progress on that issue this summer. And um, that's the work that he alluded to in the end of his talk yesterday. But it's still, just to be honest, much slower than the complex <coughs> analytic method. It could have the possible advantage if ever we got to the situation like Drew Sutherland was able to show in the elliptic curve case, where you can take advantage of the fact that you save on the space complexity with this algorithm. So if we ever got to the point where computation time was not the bottleneck, then maybe asymptotically this could still be worthwhile. And I have to say honestly, I can't comment too much on the pluses and minuses of this piatic method because I, I don't know it as well as the others. But I do know, for example, that some of the larger class numbers um, that David has told me about are 
for kind of specific choices of fields. So it doesn't seem to me that this works uniformly well for all CM fields K either. But it's a different kind of criteria than the ones I've mentioned, for example, the restriction to F having class number one. So in my view, these all kind of have many pluses and minuses. And in the end, I think we still don't know, you know asymptotically which one will be the best. Based on the elliptic curve situation, you might guess that even though this one looks like the turtle, that it might end up winning out in the end over, over the hair. And although David has a very convincing database, I would still have to say that, in my opinion, this one looks like the hair right now, <laughs> the one speeding out front. Um, OK, so now I'd like to spend the last uh, five or 10 minutes talking about the joint work with Michael Narig. So we gave a few examples in my paper with Chung Hai based on some Paris code that I wrote, which is in the end of the paper. But um, Michael has written um, magma code for this, uh, for, these, for this algorithm and extended it and improved it in many ways. And there's still many more improvements to be made and investigated. And we also have as part of the object to study, understand the factorization of the coefficients of the class polynomials for these Hilbert modular forms, much in the same way that we've tried to understand them for the Ziegel modular um, functions. OK, so here's just a, an example just to get us started. So this is class number one. Um, I should have asked Michael, but I strongly suspect that 3,000 digits of precision was not absolutely necessary here. I think that was kind of a blanket precision that was set um, if I had to guess from doing examples of this size, I think I was often able to make it work with 400 digits. I think you might have even said you did 400 digits of precision to begin with. But um, the next line here is telling you how many terms in the Eisenstein series you needed. So that's the analog of when you're evaluating theta functions and you, ha and you evaluate them basically by summing over a box or an ellipse. So how big is that ellipse? How many terms do you need for your theta function to be accurate up to a certain precision? Well, the analog of that here is how many terms in the Fourier series do you need in order to um, be accurate up to a certain precision? We've actually done some estimates which are not in the paper, which have um, given ba bounds on the size of the tail. So you can really know how accurate you are with a certain number of terms. And then, um, so this was the time for computing 8.4 seconds. But this was, uh, Michael says, on his laptop, which is not particularly fast. And it was running magma. Um, but you could see, I mean, these are like strikingly small. Of course, this is a small example. But these are very small class, class polynomials in the sense that um, uh, just the size of their coefficients. Um, so I'm going to skip ahead maybe to, I might just go to the last example unless people have questions about intermediate ones. So here is a, what I would consider to be a large example, which is class number eight. So some people can do class numbers much bigger than this probably. but. Um, so, but this, oh, does it have the timing on here? OK, so I think it's, I think Michael said an hour and a half, roughly. Is that right? Yeah. So an hour and a half just on his laptop. So that's not too bad for something of this size. And these are much, much smaller than the EGUSA functions would be. OK, so um, I think the only other comment that I want to make is, is that he's using J2 and J4 here so that these denominators will be exactly what um, these, this is essentially the denominator here. Because if you made this monic, you would, you would uh, multiply through by that. And here's the, well, here's the factorization of this one. So you can see all the small primes, like what Bianca was talking about yesterday, appearing. These are the primes in the Brunier-Yang formula. So both this method and the, um, and this Chinese remainder method are in incredibly assisted by the, by the knowledge of the actual factorization of the denominator so that you don't have to multiply through by um, something coming from my bounds with Gorin, which just give you an upper bound on the power 
of the prime that can appear and an upper bound on the size of the prime that can appear. These are the Brunier Yang thing is actually giving you the precise factorization and it requires you to save a huge amount of computation by using that instead of just using a rough bound. Okay, so with that, I think I will stop five minutes early. Questions for Kristen? Can the formulas to go uh, from a curve to its uh, Grunewald pairings? Yeah. Uh, I think that would then, be nice. And then to go back, you sort of went via the igloos of Yeah. The well, you have a prime and well, family of mess for these things. The these invariants for D from the five go back to number. I mean, you can just write down this since it's rational. But there, there's one problem that I, well, one question that I have, how much is this restricted to D equals 5? Because in general, as the discriminant grows, you expect these surfaces to be of general type, and they'll no, they'll no longer have a rational parameter. No, I agree with you. I mean, that's essentially the restriction on the field that we're looking at, is that so far, D should not grow D should not be very large. In, it's, in the way we're doing things, D should not be very large. But on the other hand, for a fixed D, you can have lots and lots of CM fields that have that as it's. All of these have real quadratic subfield Q square root 5. So there's going to be many CM fields that you can cover this way. But for now, you should assume that D is small. Do these steps for Q put on the green lock variants indicate a weight of a modular function? Or just no, 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 no. Those are not. Just like for Igusa, it's I1, I2, I3, or, or whatever. They're just first and second and third. <coughs> The, the weight, I mean, they're functions, so, but the, the weights on the G's were the weight. Those are, like, G2, that was the weight. 2 was the weight. G4, theta 10, those are weights. But then they're canceled out because they're taking a function. Igor? So using a logical explanation, why you have small primes, and then it suddenly jumps? Where do you mean small primes? You would say, take any it contains small primes in its localization, and then it jumps, except for well, these are of a kind of a, a natural form that's going to be consistent across all examples because they're symmetric functions of these roots. And you can kind of see the size of the roots in terms, like if you use the Fourier expansion anyway. You can see kind of how big they are. So, or, well, at least for the size. Now, here you're asking, like, do I have any reason why? Yeah, why it jumps out of this so, so much? Or oh, in the previous condition. Okay, what you should think about is separate this coefficient from these. This one is special because yeah, it's sure. the denominator. For these, um, the answer is no. I mean, I actually have some work which I wasn't going to mention, but which is in some sense related. There is a geometric expression for numerators which can understand, it can capture geometrically the property of primes that appear in all the numerators. But so what happens for that is, is that you don't get information, or generally you don't get information about these bigger primes. These just appear to be random. And I have no idea about the size, like, you know, why this factorization has one of this size and this one smaller. I don't know if there's a reason or not. So I'm just thinking about factorization, the consistent way that the prime well, that's a good question. So this one is not in the denominator, actually. Five isn't. Um, although it's possible that it was there and it was canceled by lots of fives here. Three um, Yeah. <laughs> Francois? Yes, if, if we want to imitate what we do in genus 1, uh, why not try to reduce the polynomial like uh, using latent uh, LLL and so on, just to see if you can get small polynomials and then perhaps guess some uh, function which could be smaller. Then did you try to, to, to use Poloed or whatever on P4 to see? 
get a very small volume of you, and if it has some interpretation or... No, I never did. So the point is that if you got some smaller polynomial, I mean, like you're thinking of it as defining a lattice, and... I mean, like that just la lattices is just for, for it's a tool, but I mean, trying to, to find auxiliary functions like uh, in genus one, when you replace J, where yeah, some, and so you, you can try to take a basic polynomial like this, reduce it, and if something striking happens, then maybe you see there's a, a new function. Now. And in genus one, do you ever find like new functions that way that you wouldn't find by like just taking you know the ones you know like Weber or whatever? But we do everything in genus one. <laughs> the question is to oh. guess what we <laughs> do in <laughs> Discovering functions like this is no. the question. I've never done that. C4 zero does that factor a bit better or just what we can't see? Oh, sorry. Well, yeah, so you see still huge powers of 2 and 5 here. So, uh, let's see. Is it on here? Oops. Sorry. I could look in the text file. You can look later. Huh? Is there a possibility to combine the um, method you discussed with CRT method so that maybe you find the answer mod some small prime, say you use your method to get high, bit, high digits with, uh, without worrying as much about precision and then use CRT to, get the, to adjust the lower yeah, so we actually thought about that. Um, Damien had some ideas about that. And um, there, even it, like in the context of the CRT method, there is a reason to, if your real quadratic field is like say Q squared five, to actually use this, this technique inside the loops of the CRT method. Um, but, um, there's a little, there's a trade-off there. It's, uh, it's not always the right thing to do, but it can help. But I think also so there's probably you other combinations. The space from Q, P cube to P square, which you just didn't write inside of the uh, this demo. That's right, but um, without saying too much um, about the new approach that we have, there's, it's not as good as other things in some cases, sometimes. Sometimes, certainly. Actually, David David Grunewald mentioned that in his thesis for the Igusa functions case. Uh, I mean, what, like if, if you're sorry for the complex analytic um, methods. So that if you have a fixed real quadratic field, then it's better to to loop over. Um, oh, I forget. I didn't know this. What did he say in his thesis? But anyway, David Grunewald made it. A related observation. And anyway, what I was going to say to you, Tony, is that I think that um, there's actually a lot of potential combinations here between these different things. And there's certainly tricks that are used in the other methods that we're now trying to apply to this one as well, such as like the Lagrange interpolation for defining the invariance and things like that. Oh, well, I only have an announcement or a question. So today there will be again a catered lunch outside. Tomorrow we'll have a slightly longer lunch break. So we have till 2.30 tomorrow, and we'll go over to the comments where you can have, well, you, you pay for what you eat, but you can pick exactly what you want to eat. The reason I make this announcement now is that for tomorrow, please make sure to bring your name tag, including the Microsoft badge that you got on the first day. If you lost yours, they can reprint one for you. And please make sure to have cash for your lunch tomorrow, because they can't accept cards. But for today, well, enjoy it again. Are there any other questions? All right, let's thank Kristen again.